I think the media is a very important stakeholder in ensuring that we, we, we do that. So this is more about, about it. And um, as you'll see, the, the, the development of the Act was a long drawn process, which commenced as far back as 2015 and was only signed into law in 2019. Hence, we call it the Film and, and, and Publications uh, Amendment Act of 2019. However, as part of the um, a process to allow the readiness, uh, the establishment of certain things, to even to put in place regulatory mechanisms. The, 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 you, you, you allow the President uh, Protection of Information um, um, Act, you recall that it's 2013, but some sections of it were only uh, um, allowed to come into force uh, as far back as last year, uh, in 20, I mean, July 2021. It's normal, same thing with um, Cyber Crimes Act. So it's a normal process, hence the, the time lag between when the act was passed into law and when should the act take its effect. So the one that you're going to talk today about um, only took, was only signed into law in 2019, but to allow the other regulatory processes in particular to be completed, um, the president only signed it, signed the proclamation for the act to take effect um, on the 1st of, of July. Um, with me, as you can see, um, is a team from the department, um, that is the policy maker, led by the Deputy Minister, Honorable uh, Fili um, Mapulani. And next to him on the right is the Chair of the Film and Publication Board, um, Ms. Zama Mkosi. Um, next to her on the extreme right is Pandeli uh, Gregorio. Uh, Pandeli is the Shared Executive, the shared executive, executive Head at the uh, Film and Publication. And then next to me here um, is Advocate Nevodre, who is also a, uh, a council member of the Film and Publication Board. So they'll be um, you know, dealing with the various aspects as per the program that we'll outline quite shortly um, now. But the very important thing is the, the, the issues that are contained in the bill and the manner in which we try to address them. They are not peculiar to South Africa. Throughout the world, everyone is talking about what they call broadly online harms. Um, the, the, the degree to which they delve into that differ from one jurisdiction to, to, to the next. Now, if you look at this slide, which is very interesting, it will tell you what is happening across the world. But of major significance, you can see, it's just that unfortunately you can't read. At the, the bottom end, there is South Africa, to say we are only dealing with only four issues. But look at what other countries are dealing with. It's quite extensive. Even now, as we speak, um, there is a process underway in UK, uh, for those who, of you who follow this kind of discussions, about the bill, on the same issues, online safety bill. A lot of discussions going on. In Australia, their law was only passed a few, I think last year, but it was only operationalized in January. So it's not something peculiar to South Africa. They, for us, the most important thing is how do we balance um, the constitutional freedoms of the people against the need to um, ensure that they are protected against online harm. So that's, those are some of the issues that we'll try to deal with um, uh, uh, this morning. And this is our program. Uh, like I mentioned, we have the, um, the Deputy Minister in our midst will provide the um, uh, uh, context because as the policy maker, there's a context why certain things are being, are being done. And you'll take us through that and then followed by the chair on the purpose. Uh, without further ado, I will request the Honourable Deputy Minister to take us um, through the contextualization. Honourable Minister, Deputy Minister. What am I going to do with this? Good morning, good morning, um, the Chair of the Films and Publication Board, uh, together with Council members, uh, Dr. Boloko, the, the Acting Chief Executive Officer, uh, and officials from the Film and Publication Board, and to all of you, uh, members of the media, 
members of the fourth estate. Let me take this opportunity to welcome you all here on this important day, this very historic day, uh, when we launch the operationalization of the Film and Publication Board Amendment Act, which came to operation on the 1st of March. We think that this is very historic in the manner in which uh, online content is going to be regulated going forward. As we know that this bill or this act came into operation on the 1st of March after the President has proclaimed the date of operation, we are today creating an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to give you insights into the changes and, other, and the amendments and most importantly to clarify your questions about the amendment. As human beings, we are built for progress. It is in our DNA to strive for bigger and better as we adapt to survive and to conquer our environment. History has shown that we often are willing to sacrifice in the name of advancement. At the start of the second industrial revolution, few would have predicted that the burning of fossil fuels would have such disastrous effect on our environment. And yet our industrialization has given us the ability to become the most successful species on the planet. And now we are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, a time when things that would have seemed like science fiction a century ago have become the new norm. The penetration of new technologies and the reliance of digital platforms in South Africa is undeniable. Just some few statistics. According to the Audit Bureau of Circulation of South Africa, in the first quarter of 2020, daily newspaper circulation declined by 14% over the previous year, with weekend newspapers declining by 17%. At the same time, statistics from Data Reportal shows that mobile connections in South Africa increased by 3.1 million between January 2019 and January 2020 to 103.5 million. Internet penetration stood at 62%, an increase of 3.1% year on year and social media penetration at 37%, which is an increase of 19% year on year. The move to consume content online is a global one, both in developed and developing countries, with more and more people receiving their news information, their news information and entertainment through the internet. At the same time, a significant power shift has occurred. The gatekeeper role of curated information, once held by the traditional media, is starting to dissolve with the ability of ordinary citizens to share their opinions far and wide using the social media. This, ladies and gentlemen, opens up an age-old debate about the right of, to freedom of speech versus the need to protect social cohesion and the personal dignity of citizens. In other ways, how do we balance the rights and responsibilities that are firmly entrenched in our Constitution? In the old world of offline content consumption, South Africa has been held up as an example of content classification framework for films, games, and certain publications that aptly balances these rights. Our Film and Publication Board has been an inspiration for many content regulators, especially on the continent. The Kenyan system draws heavily from our regulator, and we have recently concluded a memorandum of understanding with Eswatini regulator to share best practices from our framework. Historically, we have moved away from censorship post-apartheid and adopted a content classification system that instead provides clearly labeled age ratings and consumer advisories. 
The only content that is not allowed relates to those aspects that we as South Africans find offensive or unconstitutional, such as the hate speech, incitement to horror, child sexual abuse material, bestiality, etc. This puts the power in the hands of the consumer to make informed choices of what they want to view or read and to, li to likewise make these choices to pre protect their children from exposure to content that can cause developmental and psychological harm. We've come a long way, ladies and gentlemen, since the Film and Publication Act was put in place in 1996. Over the years, we have refined our systems and processes to format we currently use. To the best of ability, we have worked to make sure that this system is fair and transparent, and that it has several checks and balances to ensure that our classification decisions are objective. The most important part of this is the extensive consultation that we undertook when we craft the laws and classification guidelines that we use. Our classification committees are made up of members of South African public with expertise in psychology, law, content creation, etc. Over the years, ladies and gentlemen, we've seen a reduction in the number of appeals received. From 2015, 2016, and 2020-2021, we saw a 40% decline in the appeals against the Films and Publication Board classification decisions, reflecting on the robustness of our system. The number of companies that are in the business of selling films, games, and publication to consumers in online formats have exploded in recent years. Because the online world is borderless, it is now easier than ever before for consumers to access news, information, entertainment created in other countries. Many of these countries have very different values and beliefs from ours here in South Africa. A good example is the attitude towards sexualized content. A content distributor in, in Europe, for an example, selling a film or game to European citizens does not do so within the boundaries of what is acceptable in that particular European setting. That content is not necessarily what a South African mother would want the children to be expected to be exposed to. It is therefore important that this same content is reassessed before it is distributed in South Africa so that we empower our own consumers before they access the content. This does not in any way change just because the content is distributed in an online format. The regulation of online content that is still fair and transparent is the only solution to protect children or vulnerable people. We simply cannot, ladies and gentlemen, allow content that will cause harm to an individual or to the social cohesion of our country to remain unregulated. The Films and Publication Amendment Act seeks to achieve exactly that. This is the very reason that we embarked on a process to amend the Films and Publication Act. We started in 2015. Uh, it was finally enacted by Parliament and assented to by the President in 2019. So the colleagues from the entity, the Films and Publication Board, will take us through some of the changes and how they affect the distributor of content as well as the public. We have arranged this media briefing in the form of a sort of a workshop so that members of the public can be informed about what, are they, what is the impact of this new act, uh, because it's quite significant. There's a significant departure from how previously content was regulated. So I would like to thank you very much, uh, members of the Fourth Estate, from gracing our occasion and coming to interact with us as we continue to embark on a process of public education around 
the changes that have been made, uh, that has been brought about by the Amendment Act. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, um, Deputy, Honorable Deputy Minister. Uh, Honorable Deputy Minister has been leading us in ensuring that we indeed um, implement this act without fail because it's in the public interest that, that uh, we do that. And we should always thank you for your support and leadership as well as guidance, um, on, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. And indeed, I think, as you said, the the MOUs with, with, with Kenya won't be the only one. I think there's a lot that we're still going to undertake, both locally, regionally, and, and globally. This is because of the complexity of the online, online environment. The, the entities that are within the scope of, of um, this act, a lot of them are not South African. Therefore, for you, and I mean, when you deal with online, you're dealing with a sector that is like Amoeba, you know, it's always changing, complexity and everything else. So you can't do it on your own. You need um, the assistance of others uh, because it's transnational on its own. Um, when you want to take certain websites down, you may need another country to help you in doing that. So that's why the importance of, of, of having this kind of, uh, one, um, agreements and two, they need to harmonize instruments so that that which these guys do or these entities do in other countries, um, they find it the same way in, in, in South Africa without um, any, any fail. Thank you very much, DM. Um, at this time, allow me to um, invite um, the chairperson of the Film and Publication Board, um, Ms. Zama Mkosi, to kind of tell you the purpose of this amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Um, acknowledging um, in our midst, obviously, the Deputy Minister and thanking him very much for the ongoing support for the work of the entity. Uh, also acknowledging the council members in attendance uh, this morning, the, the media that has graced us with our presence, both physically and virtually, and um, as well as the fellow South Africans. Um, members of the media, I think you have been thanked and I would like to echo the thanking once again for the role that you play in assisting uh, entities like ourselves to educate and empower the public uh, by sharing facts, uh, by sharing information in a manner that will assist um, every South African to understand exactly the work that um, that the lawmakers are, are making and all the other arms of government are working hard to make sure that they are putting in place uh, for their protection. And uh, this morning we're hoping for a fruitful engagement that will assist us in really sharing the benefits and the implication of the FPB Amendment Act because we are aware that there still exist uh, certain misperceptions uh, out there. And hence, we have also brought some of the, the members of the internal uh, team within the FPB to get a bit more technical in explaining some of the definitions and perhaps some of the clauses, because we believe that information is power. And so we cannot allow for misperceptions to reign um, uh, out there. So we are hoping that we'll come out of this session with clarity and uh, having created a better understanding of the Amendment Act. And um, I think it, it still goes uh, without saying that the intent of the, of the Act is really to protect the citizens of South Africa and to protect them from, uh, from content that is likely to cause them harm. And, um, and we have a, a, a history 
as the FPP that um, even though it's a history that may have started uh, in, in censorship, but we have come a long way uh, from that. We have moved a great deal and even this act is a reflection of that journey of movement in creating a balance uh, between uh, protecting uh, the rights of freedom of, of expression, but also on the other hand, uh, making sure that we protect against harm. So we are aligned to bring the law in um, to advance and, and align with the digni digital uh, technology because uh, we cannot overlook, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that the online space brings about both benefits and challenges, and we are aware of that. There are extensive benefits, of course, and these benefits really are quite progressive in allowing individuals to express themselves and live out their freedom of expression. However, on the same breath, we understand that the digital technology has created uh, more platforms for trauma to be caused um, either by one individual or another, or even at a larger scale where public violence and war ha can be incited. You know, we don't need to look far to see that there have been numerous cases where mental anguish has been caused uh, because uh, of online bullying, trolling, uh, severe character assassination, harassment, and all of these leading to real life implications such as even suicide in certain instances, which is not desirable for our country. So don't to mention the potentially disastrous effects uh, that the circulation of fake news can create in destabilizing our country. So the law still uh, has a long way to go. I think we'll be the first to admit that because catching up with uh, technology, um, especially when it comes to lawmaking, it is it is something that uh, that is uh, not an easy one. But uh, having said that, it goes a long way in closing the gap uh, in balancing the right to freedom as well as the protecting the public from potential harmful harmful content. As you may know, the FPB Act um, of uh, Act 65 of 1994 was uh, established uh, for FPB to be a regulator regulating the creation, production, possession, and distribution of films, games, and certain publications. The object uh, of the Act was to make sure that content classification is used by FPB to protect consumers from harmful, disturbing material while allowing adults to make informed choices for themselves, but having been informed, but also making sure that children in their care are provided with consumer advice. And the second role was to protect children from exposure to disturbing and harmful material. And lastly, to make sure that we make the use of children in pornography and exposure to pornography punishable. The FPB model, as it was uh, indicated earlier by the acting CEO, is aligned to international standards. So I won't really repeat that point. Uh, but it still remains that any distributor who wishes to distribute content in South Africa for sale they need and they are required to submit that content to the FPB for classification. But it's important to emphasize at the outset that classification is not censorship. Censorship entails the blocking and a removing of content from distribution from any country. And in South Africa, prohibited content relates to hate speech, incitement of violence, propaganda for war, child pornography, and bestiality. This prohibited content, this list of prohibited content, very much aligns with, um, with the Constitution and what is considered unacceptable. Since the creation of the FPB Act way back in 1994, however, the world has seen significant changes. You know, significant changes even in the manner in which content is created, in which content is distributed, in which content is even consumed. So uh, we've seen a migration of the consumption to online platforms. And as a result, the evolution of FPB Act was um, inevitable. And 
even then the evolution of the list of the content that will be prohibited also needs to evolve because consumption patterns, content creation patterns have also since evolved. So with this act, you will see that there has been an expansion on, um, on the list of content that is prohibited. However, I would assure the South African public that even in that extension, all of that content is still aligned with the Constitution because at the end of the day, that is the ultimate law of the land. And this process was embarked upon by the FPB, certainly not unilaterally. However, there was extensive consultation, there was extensive independent research as well that was, um, that was conducted. And in that research, a conclusion was reached that legislation, policies, and procedures, they certainly need to reflect the technological advances. In short, the South African, um, the, the FPB Act modernizes our law, ladies and gentlemen, in order to bring it closer to the reality of the digital world that we live in. It introduces two approaches in particular, which I would like to quickly go through. The first approach we title self-regulation, which is FPB entering into license agreements with online distributors. This is an instance where online distributors undertake their own process of classification. However, using the guidelines, the classification guidelines that are approved by the FPB. And the second approach also to emphasize is the distinction between commercial online distributors and non-commercial uh, distributors. Only commercial online distributors will be required to register and classify. This is a very important distinction to emphasize uh, because a member of the general public posting user-generated content on the internet or any of the social media platforms does not fall within the definition of commercial distributor and therefore will not be required to register or submit their content to FPB for classification. So, because there's a common misperception that we will continue to emphasize as well, and we wish for the public to be clear on that the FPB has no jurisdiction over non-commercial distributors, only in the event of a complaint having been laid by a member of the public because of the content that, may, that was generated by, by that member of the public. And that complaint has to be aligned with the prohibited content which I have just listed, hate speech, propagating of, of war, incitement to violence, and so on. However, an additional list um, of, of co prohibited content that has been added is um, any content that deals with unauthorized distribution of private sexual photos and audiovisual content, as well as content depicting sexual violence and violence against children. This is a very important change that is brought about by the Amendment Act. Um, and, you will, and as I said earlier, that it really has to make sure that it continues to be aligned with the Constitution. An additional uh, change that has been brought about by the amendment is the establishment of an enforcement committee. This is an impartial quasi-judicial body that is to be chaired by a retired judge and will conduct investigations uh, of disputed cases that contravene the provisions of the Act and their powers will also extend to imposing sanctions as are outlined in the Amendment Act. The Appeals Tribunal, which is an independent body, will remain in existence to hear appeals that may arise uh, because of rulings of the FPB or the Enforcement Committee. And this, ladies and gentlemen, continues to be the checks and balances that are put in place. So the journey of modernizing the FPB Act has been a long one. Um, from the days of being a censorship body to a body that is mandated to protect the rights of all citizens. 
It's a journey, as I said earlier, that has not been taken lightly, but one has been characterized by independent research, by thorough and extensive consultation with stakeholders across uh, the South African public. So we firmly believe that this piece of, le of legislation and regulations is a step in the right direction. Further engagements with key stakeholders will continue to be initiated, roundtable discussions with critical role players at, in order to find ways of working together amicably in the implementation of this act are planned and will be rolled out over the next couple of months. And we are confident that these will bear positive results uh, that will ultimately benefit the citizens, that uh, all South Africans, whether public or private stakeholders, we are ultimately committed to serve the South African public. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, um, I will hand over back to the program director who will also get uh, members of our team to take you into some of the technicalities of the act. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, uh, Chairperson. Um, indeed, I think that which we said to say we could have just issued a media statement, but we thought we should capacitate you as members of the media uh, so that you don't have to understand this law through the eyes of um, um, experts out there, simply because sometimes I think some of them might not have read this, but they make comments that may be misleading to the public. I think the issue of censorship is very key. If you look at other jurisdictions, we've got lots of cases on um, shutdowns. Um, with us, this law provides the scope of our, our work and how we're going to do it. That's clarity instead of leaving it to arbitrary or kind of uh, uh, discretionary decisions under, within, as guided by, by, by the Constitution. And I think the, the messages, both from the Deputy Minister and, and, and the Chairperson, is more to underline that point to say, we want to capacitate you more. This is not about uh, censorship, but it's very important to ensure that our, our citizens are, public, are protected from online harms. And for members of the public, they need to understand that part, that we don't want to regulate um, the, uh, I mean, their user-generated content. Um, it's more to say the, that click that you're going to make, make sure that that content that you, you distribute is not prohibited or it's not harmful, because that is at the essence of this. As long as it's not prohibited, as long as it's not harmful, um, you won't be um, regulated in that. But I think that's the most important thing. And allow me to call um, a head of, of uh, executive of uh, shared service at FPB, um, Pandeli, to take you through some of the uh, definitions for your own benefits. Pandeli. Thank you very much to the Deputy Minister, our Chairperson, Members of Council, um, and Program Director, our Interim CEO. Um, I sadly have the boring task. I'm going to go into the details. The exciting bit has already been shared by the other previous speakers. So what I will do in a very short space of time is just give a bit of an indication of what those applicable provisions in the Amendment Act speak to and provide a little bit more life to the document, right? The Chairperson has articulated the previous objects of the Film and Publications Act. Um, it has been expanded. It now includes two further objects, and I thought it was important to share what those two additional objects are. The first is the criminalizing the possession, production, distribution of child pornography. And the second is creating offenses for non-compliance with the Act. Now, I will deal with the second because that's one of the issues that I think has assisted us greatly in terms of how do we deal with matters that are properly before the Film and Publication Board. The, in the past, prior to the Amendment Act, um, they weren't, the provisions in the legislation weren't definitive enough to assist us to be able to deal with issues relating to non-compliance, right? Now that we have extensive provisions in the Amendment Act, it actually assists us to ensure that where non-compliance exists, we can take it to the natural conclusion and we can assist in, in ventilating those matters as the chairperson has alluded to, the independent body that has been created by the Amendment Act, which is the Enforcement Committee. 
Now, one of the provisions that I want to highlight in particular is Section 15, Capital A of the Amendment Act, and that now has amended the provisions which speak to the work of our compliance officers. One of the issues that you would have heard and some of the issues that we've received as an institution is, you know, what does this mean? What does this Amendment Act mean to us as members of the public? What Section 15, Capital A does, and the emphasis point that we want to share is that the provisions relating to our compliance officers dictate, prescribe that the first thing that they need to do is advocate. They need to advocate the extent to which our act applies, the scenarios to which they apply, and assist our stakeholders to, to, to be compliant with the provisions of the legislation. It's only when that fails do we trigger the enforcement provisions. So it's actually a le legislative requirement, and I think that's an emphasis point that we wanted to highlight. Now, Chairperson has also alluded to some of the specific provisions, and I know there's a distinction between publications and film and game content. I think it's an important distinction to draw. The first thing that I want to share, and I think it's, it could be posed, especially relating to social media, um, in addition to the, the, the information that has been shared by the chairperson, one should note that publications are not subject to pre-distribution classification. Firstly, in terms of how the provisions are crafted, certain content is specifically excluded from application and will not fall within the purview of the Film and Publication Board. In essence, that would be publications published by members of the Press Council of South Africa, as well as advertising that is regulated by the uh, regulatory body that governs advertising in the country. Specifically excluded does not fall within the purview of our legislation. The second is, and what the category of content that would be subject to pre-distribution classification when it comes to publications, and that would be important to note, is that content which includes propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence, and what we colloquially refer to as hate speech. It's an important distinction to draw, especially in the space within which we're now going to discuss how we deal with online content, especially content that is going to be distributed and exhibited on social media platforms. So that's how we deal with, with publications. Now, the, some of the provisions that has been shared by the chairperson, I think it's important just to highlight. It is important to note that our Amendment Act does um, assist us in entering into a co-regulatory relationship with our online distributors. That's the self-classification provision. The chairperson has given you detail there. But the other provision that we needed to share with you is the accreditation of foreign or international classification systems. That's done by, that's done by application and considered and approved by our council. And that's something that we need to share with you in terms of how we will also deal with those kinds of applications. The other issue, and I think this is an important note, and my concluding remark relates to several of the provisions that have um, expanded the mandate of the Film and Publication Board, especially relating to those in terms of content that is distributed in social media. Just to emphasize exactly the point that the chairperson has raised is the members of the public can lodge complaints to the Film and Publication Board when social media contains prohibited content. We define prohibited content to include propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence, and like I said, what we colloquially refer to as hate speech. The moment that appears on social media platforms, it does not matter that you're a commercial online distributor or a non-commercial online distributor. You have the ability to lodge a complaint with the Film and Publication Board, which as I've alluded to in terms of Section 15, Capital A, our colleagues will investigate. And once a case is ready to be ventilated before the Enforcement Committee, that's the avenue that we will pursue. So the process has to be followed. We have to ensure that the content, firstly, amounts to any that, anything that falls within those categories. And it's only in that instance where, those, where that case has been sufficiently motivated for that we'll be able to present those matters to the Enforcement Committee. The Enforcement Committee is an independent quasi-judicial body and they will ventilate and consider the matters as that independent body. It's not the Film and Publication Board that is going to make the determination. In fact, it will be the Enforcement Committee. And like I said, as the, thankfully what the chairperson has highlighted, even in that instance, if you are dissatisfied with the outcome of that matter, you have the ability to lodge an appeal for, before the appeal tribunal, giving you a second bite of that cherry. So those are some of the provisions I wanted to share. It could be a lot longer. But uh, we can engage in the question and answer session should there be anything else that colleagues want to find out. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Pandeli. Um, I think on our part, even beyond this media briefing, we will create opportunities for members of the public uh, to engage with us uh, because it's important that they understand this uh, just beyond the technical level. The nuts and bolts of this uh, amendment act and as the film and publication board um, will engage with um, the, the st and stakeholders and ordinary people at home uh, in their own languages to understand the, the, the implications of, of this act on, on them. But this um, Act, as you will see, um, has really transformed the, um, the, the, the FPB as an organization. One, it has expanded its Monday's three falls. In other words, um, from what you used to know as the Film and Publication Board as a, 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 a simple classification authority, now we are a fully fledged regulator with the, with the powers to. Um, with the powers to accredit, um, issue licenses, renew, as well as, as impose fines through the, the enforcement committee, which is an, an independent body. Um, the, the key question is, what does it mean for, for the entity? Um, now we've got legitimate powers, but what does it mean um, for the entity? It means we cannot, it can be business as usual. One of the things that you have to do is really to transform the organization um, and, and align it to um, this expanded mandate. That's why I think for the medium term, we'll actually be working harder to transform this organization, both skills-wise, both technologically, um, to ensure that indeed we are technologically capable to... Um, uh, technologically capable to enforce the provisions of this law in cases of, of non-compliance. So what I'm going to do just to take you two slides to look at how ready we are, because if the organization is not ready, then it means the, the, the act won't be implemented. Um, and, and together, the minister and the deputy minister have made sure that indeed we, we, we um, implement the act. There's no way, there's no two way about it. So. Um, from an organizational point of view, we have started um, reworking the process internally um, to try and, 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 and adjust to the new provisions. As you can see now, as a fully fledged regulator, we no longer regulate by just mere arrangements. We are fully fledged regulators, I've mentioned. What is it that we need to do? And those are the activities that will drive us uh, during the medium term, making sure that organizationally we are ready, we align, we align the organizational structure, we've got regulatory instruments, because the capacity for any regulator to regulate the, the industry, you need robust and clear instruments that will enable you to do that and enforce. Because if we don't have uh, adequate regulatory instruments, it means the enforcement committee uh, will find this job difficult to, to, um, to implement. We, have, we are going to do a lot of research because in the absence of research, ongoing research, um, to guide our regulatory making processes, the, the instruments won't be um, um, evidence-based. It will just be thumb-sucking. So there's a lot of work that we are going to do. And again... Because we can't do this on our own, we need the support and collaborations with other um, regulators, both locally and internationally. That is the other part that will drive our work uh, in, in ensuring that we are aligned, we share skills, we share notes. Um, in certain cases, they may request that we do certain activities um, like takedowns of or certain websites because they are within our own jurisdictions. We have to do that. We'll, we'll do that as well. So we, we, those are some of the activities that will drive us. Now, what is it that we have done since the, the Act um, came into law uh, in 2019? We, there are regulations that are currently underway. The one thing that you have to do is to look at how adequate they are, because if you look at, and I would want to refer members of the media to the, what they call the E-Safety Commission in, in Australia. Following the promulgation of, of the, um, the, the, the Online Safety Act, what is that they to do beyond what they had? because they realize that we're far away from uh, uh, um, regulating this industry 360 degrees. They started to engage in a thorough process. They're still doing it now um, to ensure that they've got um, the updating and development of um, um, necessary regulations to ensure that their, their work is executed. There are guidelines um, around classification so forth that are currently being uh, published. The closing date is on the 18th. We still request members of the public to make comments on those because they have got an impact on them, particularly the, the distributors. 
And then on our part, I think we are doing that assessment to ensure what kind of regulations do we need further in addition to what we have. Are they adequate? Are they aligned? So that's an intensive exercise that we are doing. Um, organizationally, we are trying, we have started streamlining the functions to ensure that the mandate, that the expanded mandate that has been accorded to us by the Act is indeed elevated. And there's a lot of work that is currently underway together uh, with the, the, the council, led by the council and uh, with the guidance of the department to ensure that indeed we are aligned to, to that. And, and one of the things that we are likely to see um, later when the, um, the minister and the deputy minister table our, our uh, strategy will ensure that indeed it's aligned perfectly to this new amendment uh, because the strategy should be able to guide us where we are going in, the, in our priorities in the uh, medium term. The issue of enforcement has been elevated um, because any regulator's ability to, to do its work is based on the ability to enforce the regulation that it has. And um, as the chair said, the introduction of the enforcement committee, we should be ready for that. They are going to be inducted once they are appointed uh, by council as required by law. They are going to be um, inducted, chaired by the retired So we are putting in system to ensure that when they come in, uh, we are ready. Um, and on our side, I think this is the other part that we are working on to ensure how adequate we are as the future re content, content regulator. So the, the process to appoint the enforcement committee is currently underway. Uh, together with the department, we are working um, hard to ensure that the committee um, takes office on the, on, in, by the end of this month, which is March. Um, because the other e critical issue is how are we going to fund this all this this expanded mandate and at the moment fpb is largely um funded through government um, parliamentary appropriation in other words through the fiscal but the expanded mandate is so massive in such a way that in view of the uh, the, 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 the precarious position of our fiscal owing to you know, other pressing needs, including you know, the, the responses by government on, 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 on to um, the COVID-19. Um, there's no way in which the fiscal will be able to afford or to be able to fund everything. On our own, we started a process to generate our own revenue as the entity. And because that's the benefit of, of this act in that it allows us to collect or to generate our own revenue through the, the, activi the, the regulatory activities that we do. We have already developed the enhancement strategy, revenue enhancement strategy, and during the medium term, we're going to ensure that is um, aggressively um, implemented, just to supplement that which we get from um, the fiscal so that we don't have to rely on the fiscal, otherwise it's going to be difficult. There's a lot of um, uh, financial needs, um, especially in this uh, economic de economical depression time um, characterized or induced by COVID. So we, there's a lot that currently we are doing and, and um, we, 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 we hope to further build on the support that we continue to get from our, our leadership, uh, both council and, and the, the department under the leadership of the minister and the deputy minister. Um, and we want to thank them for that kind of leadership, uh, uh, deputy minister, and thank you for keeping us on our toes all the time, um, consistently ensuring that indeed we update you on the progress. And as the FPB, we can't let down South Africans because they are looking at us when the events of um, July 2021 happened, the quick question was, who's talking about the, this violence that is being fueled on social media platforms? As a country, we could have chosen the option of shutting them down, as they have done in other countries. But we didn't do that. We, we still had to respect the constitutional right of people, um, um, freedom for speech. But now the act is here. It provides us with the parameters on which we can act, but still ensuring that we protect the citizens as well as the children um, against harmful or, or prohibited content. And thank you very much. Um, we have come to the end of the presentation. It's now an opportunity for members of the media, uh, both online and physical, um, to pose questions to the panel. We'll try um, um, or we'll make an effort to, to answer those. And those that we can't now, there's still an opportunity um, on one-on-one -on -one and various workshops, and we are prepared to undertake workshops with the public to ensure that the, uh, the provisions or the public are aware of the provisions and what it means to them um, every day. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the media here. We can start with the ones that are physical here, and then we can go online. My colleagues, I think, will coordinate the online ones.
um, uh, so we can respond as as the FPB, um, the council, and the minister. Sorry, the deputy minister. My apologies. Um, let me start with any question from online. Is there anyone coordinating that? And then I'll try and get those other ones from online platforms. Yes, ma'am. And you should be able to introduce yourself, who you are, and the media organization or media house that you are representing. Thank you very much. is how will the board deal with the uh, online video published by non press council members in the event where the exemption for press council members is extended to cover online video? The second question, broadcast and online members of the press council who publish online video were previously exempted from the pre-classification regime, but uh, and in the amendment act yeah, that's no longer the case does this mean that newsrooms will have to submit all online video before publication on websites and social media for test for certification and how will the board do that thank you very much um molemo i hope uh, pandeli you have picked that up um let's see more questions we can take them in batches Okay, while um, colleagues are bringing those ones for online platforms, may, uh, maybe let's start with whether Deputy Minister or Council want to deal with, otherwise I'll allow Pandeli to deal with. Pandeli? Thank you very much. That's a very important question. So the first thing that we need to highlight, and I try to do it, but it becomes very technical, right? Uh, it's, it is correct. There is the exclusionary category. The exclusionary category makes specific reference to members of the press council, right? Uh, but what we have done in the promulgation of our amendment regulations is to ensure, firstly, we acknowledge the reality, because I thought this was a, a question that was going to be posed, but the reality that what happens for media content that is not in a publication format, but is also in a video format. So we have considered that and accommodated for it in our amendment regulations to ensure that we do, on the premise of why that exclusionary category exists, ensure that we don't um, stretch our mandate beyond into the space of, of the media where it should not be and, and allow the, the press council to regulate that space appropriately as is prescribed in the legislation. The issue relating to what happens to those members of the press council or, or those uh, media uh, stakeholders who are not members of the press council, the provisions are the provisions, right? So it only creates those two exclusionary categories. It would then be incumbent upon those stakeholders and to engage with the Film and Publication Board to ensure that we don't have a, a challenge which may arise where where they themselves may have to engage with the Film and Publication Board to deal with the fact that they're falling within a particular vacuum. It is an issue, but we do welcome engagements with those stakeholders, especially those who are not members of the press council that fall within the media space. But what we do encourage beyond that is colleagues for also to also consider our amendment regulations. They provide a lot more direction and clarity as to how to deal with those two scenarios. Thank you very much, Pandeli. Um, colleagues, you can take us through the, the questions being filed on via online. First one is from John Fermil from my blog Um says the several and the regulatory aspects have raised the concerns that malicious actors may use the calls in the definition of hate speech and incitement to use the FPP to silence speech they don't like. How will you guard against this? And the second question is from John. What qualifies the Enforcement committee to be ruling on to be ruling on what is and what is not protected 
speech in South Africa. And let that question come from, from Chan. Other legal experts have raised concerns that the that the Adrian Act effectively criminalizes anyone who publishes content online who is not regulated by the press or not or ICASA. Are usually uh, Twitch streamers and TikTokers criminals if they don't first get their videos classified by you? And the first question, what about the content creators who do not use the platform that have that have that have a deal with you for self-classification? That is people who either run their own website or publish on alternative open source platforms that cannot afford the FP, FP, FPB fees. Are they now criminals if they don't submit their content for classification? And the fifth question, that I said I have the law. Uh, maybe let's just stop with there, otherwise there's too much. Is it the last? You still have got a lot? Uh, just two more for Jan. Okay. Can I go ahead? Yeah, okay. And uh, the fifth question, must all social media posts, including Facebook and Twitter, be submitted for classification? What is the difference between a Facebook post and a blogger? And the sixth question, uh, related to this question, what is the difference between sex workers posting nude photos to Twitter and a pornographic uh, magazine? How will the FPP handle this kind of content on social media platforms and self-hosted websites? That's our just question. Thank you. Um, while members of the panel are still jotting down. Um, I think there's one thing that we should appreciate in the Act, um, is the built-in processes to ensure that anyone who is not satisfied with the decision of the FPB can take us through. I mean, from um, the one, the enforcement committee, then you've got the, um, the, uh, the what do you call, sorry, the appeals type, the enforcement committee, then you've got the appeals type, you know. So any member who's not happy with um, the, the processes that we undertake, then can still follow those. The, um, all of these entities that I've mentioned are more independent and they have to act without um, any favor or prejudice against members of the public. And uh, the, then the last extreme case is when you pursue the matter through the courts. But I think we have built in the law provides or has built in mechanism to ensure that we don't just act ab arbitrarily. And if a member of the public is not satisfied with um, the decision that we make, he can still take them through um, other uh, processes that allow for um, reviews with internally. And then the other part is on the user-generated content. I think the chairperson really make that distinction quite clear to say that if you are not a commercial um, online distributor, you just want to post. As long as those kind of postings or those kind of content that you are distributing are not in any way harmful or prohibited um, as defined in the Act, then there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. So I don't know who wants to uh, among the panel members who wants to take some? Okay, let's start with, they're more technical, um, it's understandable. Uh, that's why you've got uh, uh, lawyers amongst us to interpret these things for us. Uh, Pandeli? There's quite a number of questions, so let's deal with them one by one. So the first question is, was specifically posted on issues relating to hate speech, right? The first thing that we need to indicate, beyond the fact that the Films and Publications Amendment Act has introduced a definition for hate speech, so that is the premise upon which we will assess all matters, we'll use the definition and apply it. There's also a extensive jurisprudence that has been built up um, in our court system as to what amounts to hate speech. Now. The, the, it almost then cross-references the next question, which relates to, you know, the, the capacity, um, who holds the position of a member of the Enforcement Committee. And I thought it would be helpful just to share with you and, and all our stakeholders that in order to be a member of the Enforcement Committee, our Amendment Act also specifically prescribes that you need to have experience and knowledge in any one or more of the following fields. Law, law enforcement, regulatory matters, 
films, games, publications, arts, literature, digital technology and electronic communications, and sentencing, right? So we're dealing with a situation that once these members of the Enforcement Committee have been appointed, they're going to have that level of capacity, and let's don't disregard the fact that the chairperson is going to be a retired or discharged judge. You're going to have those colleagues who are going to be sitting as members of the Enforcement Committee to adjudicating whether a complaint that is alleging that content amounts to hate speech in fact is hate speech. So those are the safety measures that, that are in place in the legislation that also assist us. It also expands upon what the CEO has indicated, that it's not just a final decision of the Enforcement Committee. You have the ability to take it to appeal, to the appeal tribunal. And if you're still dissatisfied, you have obviously avenues outside of the institution should you want to ventilate that further. Another question that was posed was relating to, and I'm going to call it, non-commercial online distribution of content. There is a clear distinction in our legislation, right? So as things stand at the majority of the context, we deal with commercial online distribution of content. We do not deal with the non-commercial online distribution of content, right? The instances where we will engage in the non-commercial online distribution of content is in those categories that have been captured in the legislation. Again, I'm going to list them in short. It's going to be where content contains prohibited content, and we know that prohibited content is defined in our legislation as propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence and hate speech. If it, it contains films or pictures, right, of uh, private sexual photographs and films, in essence, revenge pornography, it's colloquially referred to, if you want to lodge a complaint, but also importantly, where they have any pictures or films relating to uh, violence against children or sexual violence against children. The provisions are actually quite prescriptive. In those instances where those pictures, films appear, then you may lodge a complaint with the Film and Publication Board. Outside of that, standard user-generated content, mm -hmm. there is no basis upon which we would be able to deal with that content. It doesn't fall within our legislative purview. The next question that was posed was re regarding um, content creators who maybe fall within the in the sector of the market are not big industry stakeholders. It's important to acknowledge the fact that our tariff regime actually has a staggered approach. It deals with instances where you're a small distributor of content or even a creator of content, medium and large. So even in that space where you are a small um, commercial online distributor of content, let's say, it accommodates you in that space where you be able to engage with the former publication board and we will be able to ensure that there is a distinction between those different sectors. The tariff regime was designed in such a way to accommodate a, a not a scenario that we're only dealing with big industry stakeholders. We acknowledge that there are small, medium and large industry stakeholders and it opens it up to them in terms of uh, being compliant with the provisions of our legislation. The question relating to social media posts and, and do blogs fall within our, our provisions, it's important to look at the definition of publications. The definitions of publications are actually quite extensive. It's a very long list of what encompasses a publication. The one thing that you would know is the Amendment Act then transitions into the fact that it doesn't just mean a physical publication, it can also be done online. Blogs therefore fall within our purview only in the instance where somebody then complains that possibly your blog contains hate speech, incitement of imminent violence, it contains hate speech, um, propaganda for war. It's in that instance that somebody can lodge a complaint and say, well, this, this publication which is in a blog requires the intervention of the Film and Publication Board. So it's again, if it falls within publication, emphasis point, it's not subject to pre-distribution classification. It's only when it contains that category of content that it would trigger the interventions of the former publication board. Nothing stops anybody from lodging a request for us to classify publications. That's open to you as the members of the public, should you wish to do so. But it's not subject to pre-distribution classification. Now, pornographic content, um, we've tried to indicate as such um, the former publication board now, in terms of its amendment act, does regulate the online distribution of adult content. We obviously, in the same space with which you are distributing content, film, other content, game content in an online platform, if you are distributing adult content, you are subject to our legislative um, purview. 
right? You are falling within our space. Importantly, what the Amendment Act does, it has rather extensive provisions that speak to what you need to do as a distributor of adult content, which is far greater than other commercial uh, film content or game content. And for obvious reasons, if you're distributing adult content. So what we do suggest, even in the instance where you are posting pornographic pictures, you must know that in that space you would fall within the legislative purview of the former publication board, and we would encourage strongly that you engage with us to ensure that you do so in a compliant fashion um, and don't incur the, the, the necessary penalties that would arise if you're non-compliant. I think I've addressed all the questions. If I haven't... Thank you, Pandeli. I think regarding regarding the the tariffs, one of the things that we have been you know um, thinking about as a team um, within the organisation was to you know as we update our regulatory instruments, especially on the tariffs, there should be some exemptions um, so as to allow uh, smaller or emerging content creators to be able to distribute their content without having to face this big, um, um, what do you call that, the, the, the tariffs that they have to pay. I think that's one of those things that we'll be doing. Um, but, but we are open to suggestion on how we can deal with it moving forward because at the end of the day, this is about the South African public. Any other question? We still have got maybe 15 minutes um, to conclude. And then maybe what you can do after, submit them to us, we'll see how we can um, uh, respond to them um, outside the, the media briefing. I think we'll do that. Yes. To indicate also further questions as we go through, but I will them. Uh, the 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 um, The first question is from um, Rory Kusanas from the Citizen. Uh, so he's in, uh, in, layman, in, lay, in layman's terms, what is the commercial and uncommercial content? And uh, the second question is, what does this mean for content uh, creators in South Africa, for YouTube and TikTok and etc.? And the third question, please give an example of entities or organizations that have to register with the FPD and what is the recommendation and the registration fee? Uh, the question, does this act extend to, con to contact share for this? Well, the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies and Film and Publication Board Council and Film and Publication Board there uh, jointly uh, informing the public on the elements of the Film and Publications Amendment Act. The provisions is violence against children. Does this mean that journalists can write about violence against children? And will films be allowed to, de to depict violence against children? And the third question, do political parties count as a commercial contributors? And does this mean for them when it comes to releasing content or social, on social media? And a question from Alec from Network 24. What will the licensing cost on your contributors? I think they also have been posed that question. And the second question, could the panel explain the instances when publications have to get a pre-classification and what will be the turnaround time on that? And the last questions from Nick Hall from Interactive Entertainment South Africa. Are uh, digital content creators who make content like YouTube videos who monetize those videos through acts and sponsors should consider commercially considered commercial distributors um, to digital content creators who, who make game content like let's play or tutorials need to include the age classification of the game as part of their video and the last question with a list of various platforms who have entered into deals with uh, FPB be made available let's check thank you very much um, why are panelists still coming? <laughs> Can I ask a uh, CEO to deal with the issue around turnaround times and, and, and the commitment that you have made as part of service deal of delivery turnaround? Um, 
you can do it, you can come here. Just only turn around times, what is the community that you have on quite a while to bring on board international online distributors. Um, we have different um, tech systems, so it takes us quite a while. So what we then do is to allow a period of three months to ensure that we conclude and sign the agreement with our online distributors. So it depends on whether you are a physical distributor, and on the physical distributor it takes eight working days. And then if you're an online, internationally based distributor, it then we afford an opportunity of about two months to complete the agreements. And there was also a question raised around the tariffs. Um, we have a schedule of regulated tariffs, which is available on our website. And the tariff model is of such a nature that it distinguishes between small, medium, and large. So the tariffs differ depending on the number of content that we distribute. So please do consult that tariff uh, document. It is available on our current website. And it will uh, indicate, and you will be able to classify yourself from the, the thresholds that are in that document. If you sell from 0 to 99, you are a small. From 99 to 500 units of content, and from 500 to more than 500. So you will see those tariff distinctions are clearly displayed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So it's in response to all the questions relating to the registration fees. It's actually quite a technical document. So Giving a precise number is never going to assist. We do encourage colleagues to have a look at the tariffs. It will, it will assist greatly. With regards to the second question, which I think related to, I think specifically, you know, would WhatsApp fall within our purview? It also then um, answers some of the other questions. What I thought would be helpful is this maybe just to give everybody how the Amendment Act defines a commercial online distributor of content. Firstly, it means in relation to films, games, and publications, that content which is distributed for commercial purposes using the internet. Right? So that's, a, that's, that's on the premise upon which how we define a commercial online distributor. When you then look at the definition of distribute, which is important, it then includes beyond just sell, hire out, and offer to keep the sell and hire out content over the internet and includes the internet. It means to stream content through the internet, social media, and other electronic media. So in essence, if you fall within that definition, regardless of the platform, and we've listed quite a number of platforms, you would fall within our legislative scope. The question that then has to be answered in terms of, I think, one of the, one of the questions that was posed is, when do you fall within the commercial space and when don't you, right? And for our purposes, we obviously look at the models that are out there. It's not just uh, whether it's a transaction, it's not just whether it's a subscription, it includes where you have some sort of advertising linked to the content that you distributed. So the examples were given that if you're streaming content, but it is, you secure some sort of revenue in terms of advertising that is placed on that content, you would fall within the legislative scope of the film and publication. <coughs> so you must please just keep that in the back of your mind. Then with regards to the question relating to violence against children, I think there's a distinction that must be drawn. We're going to emphasize that. We've unpacked to a certain level um, the distinction between publications and um, film and game content. 
and especially in terms of that exclusionary category that speaks to specifically the fact that if you're a member of the press council, right, that in that space, we, it is excluded. You do not deal with those matters. So if you're somebody who's reporting on incidences of violence against children and you're reporting it in the media, that does not fall within the purview of the form of publication. However, if you receive a social media post and the image, the film, or picture depicts violence against children and you are distributing it, you are then going to fall within the legislative scope of the Film of Publication Board. Somebody can lodge a complaint with the FPB. We have the ability then to investigate that, and if there's sufficient grounds for us to lodge a complaint and, and ventilate that before the enforcement committee, we'll be able to do so. So there's just a distinction between the two, so we just need to keep that in the back of our mind. There was a specific question that was also relating to um, how we unpack um, publications, and they wanted, I think, just to give us a another sort of definitive understanding of how we distinguish between the two. Firstly, the emphasis point, publication is not subject to pre-distribution classification. The only time it will be subject to pre-distribution classification is if your publication contains propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence, or hate speech. The moment your content contains that, and you know it does, and it's a publication, it then requires you to have submitted it to the FPB for the purposes of pre-distribution classification. It doesn't mean that it's going to be, you have to wait for the outcome of the classification decision, it just means it's going to be classified by the Film of Publication Board. And then Tabi Singh has given you the time frame as to how that will all be unpacked and dealt with. The last question that was posed related to the display of classification ratings, there's a distinction between the two. Our provisions also include the fact that when you are um, advertising content for the purposes of consumption, whether you're doing it physically or online, you need to ensure that you've displayed the classification rating that is applicable to the content that you're advertising. So you need to ensure, for example, if it's a film and you're going to be exhibiting it but you want to advertise the film, the legislation prescribes that you need to demonstrate or at least display the classification rating allocated by the Film and Publication Board applicable to the content that is being advertised. And that's a requirement in terms of the legislation. I think I've dealt with all those questions as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe in the interest of time, I suggest that we um, stop the final questions. Uh, you can uh, submit those questions to us and see how we achieve it. But before we close, let me. Uh, I don't know whether from the DM, Chairperson, um, uh, Advocate Nevada, whether there's any last words before we go to the end. Thank you very much, DM and, and the colleagues, uh, for taking up those questions. I think the, the, the number of questions that we have received really underline uh, the need for us to continue engaging South Africans on this very important act. That is part of their lives because the, the, the issues that we deal with are part of everyday digital life. Um, and we must ensure that we are well dedicated. We we'll continue to engage. I um, want to thank you very much, members of the media, for your presence this morning. And we hope as you go out there, you'll be the ambassadors of, of, of this act because it's in the interest of South Africans um, that they, in the public, that they are aware about the provisions and that they, they mean to them. Um, on that note, I want to say thank you very much. Have a pleasant day. And thank you for the briefings. Thank you. So I don't know. Can the mask still be live? I don't know. I just wanted to make an announcement quickly.
there is still refreshments on the um, by the other boardrooms. Please, can you join us next time? It's fine. You can do your thing. Yes. <laughs>